Thank you very much, Yussi. Thank you for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here in Vienna. Um, I'd like to thank the organizer for bringing together so uh, many experts in uh, spectral theory. And I should also apologize that my talk won't be in quantum theory, but I'll try to uh, make some of you interested in uh, uh, Maxwell's equations and in particular in Maxwell's equation in conductive media. So uh, let me start from a brief review of the literature. So my talk will mainly be based on this paper here by uh, Sabina Bergli that talked before me, myself, Marco Marletta and Christiana Tratta that is here in the audience. Um, and uh, which was very recently accepted for publication in Journal de Mathematiques Pure Appliqué. But um, I should say that the history of this problem started in 98 with this nice paper by Matty Lassas. And then in 2019, this was somehow generalized and uh, several new results were proved in this other paper by Giovanni Alberti and uh, collaborators. And um, after this paper, there were two further contributions in the directions of the study of metamaterials. So I won't talk about this, but if you're interested, you can uh, then go and to our archive and have a look at them. So the starting point of my talk will be the classical uh, Maxwell system, where um, so E is the electric field, H is the magnetic field, and D and B so are respectively what is called electric displacement and magnetizing field. And usually when you study Maxwell equation in some medium, you need to provide some sort of relation between D, B, and E and H. So um, there are many choices here. So what we are interested mainly in this talk are so-called linear medium, so that the dependence of D and B upon E and H is linear, and is anisotropic in the sense that these epsilon and mu will be matrices that will also depend on the um, space point x where they are evaluated. So um, in particular, epsilon is usually called electric permittivity and mu the magnetic permeability of the medium. During this talk, I will assume them to be L infinity functions, and they will take values into the space of symmetric matrices, um, which with real coefficients and also bounded from below. So this in particular implies that these matrices are invertible. So um, the second example is when the um, conductivity plays a role. So in this case, you can imagine you have a medium where uh, you have some conductivity at the boundary, so this will imply that the electromagnetic wave, when interacts with this medium, will lose some of the energy, because some of this energy will be absorbed in, in the medium. So this is modeled usually by assuming that the dependence of D on E is via something of this form. So epsilon plus I sigma, where sigma is the conductivity. Again, this will be a L infinity function with values in the uh, matrices. Uh, again, it should be symmetric matrices, so yeah, sorry about this. Um, but we also allow sigma to uh, be to touch zero, so it is not in general strictly positive. This is because the case in which sigma is zero is obviously the maybe most interesting case in which you have the self-adjoint uh, Maxwell. So in time harmonic formulation, we end up with a system of this sort. So we have these two equations in which omega is the spectral parameter. And then we have the boundary uh, conditions, which are basically tangential trace of the electric field at the boundary equal to zero. Um, so if we were in 2D, this would basically be this uh, condition we saw before in one of the talks that we had um, basically the, the vector field had to be 
uh, tangential trace of, oh, sorry, no. I don't remember if it was the tangential or the normal part that I had to be zero in your talk, but uh, it would be basically uh, this condition here in 3D. And uh, I should say that, um, so the electric field E is supposed to be in this solvable space, H0 curl, meaning that the vector field and its curl are in L2, and they satisfy the boundary condition in a suitable sense, and the H will be instead in H curl. So uh, the same space without the boundary condition. Um, so for those of you that maybe uh, are not so acquainted with Maxwell, I should uh, remind there are two main things to keep in mind. So the first one is that you always have a, a Helmholtz type decomposition. So, um, so the decomposition I'm writing here is a bit different from what we have seen before because here I'm writing any L2 vector field as direct sum of a gradient field plus um, a, a vector field that has null divergence. So this means null divergence, okay? Um, for this decomposition, you don't need any assumption on the topology of the domain, okay? The second thing is this Weber's compactness result. So if you have a bounded Lipschitz domain, then this space H0 curl intersected H div. So this means the divergence is in L2, is compactly embedded in L2, okay? So this is a kind of standard result. So this in particular implies that if you are on a bounded domain, the spectrum associated with this operator will usually be made only of um, point spectrum. But uh, in general, you have to take care of, of zero. So zero will be, um, let's say, a particular point, usually an eigenvalue of infinite multiplicity. So, okay, so you have this system, we can try to give a operator formulation to it. So we can do it by looking at the linear pencil V of omega, which can be written in this form, where the domain of V of omega doesn't depend actually of omega, and it is just H0 curl um, plus H curl. And curl zero here is the operator acting as the differential expression curl on H0 curl, okay? I should say this is a very trivial pencil because as I was saying before, this matrix here is invertible. So you can rewrite it if, if you want as an operator, okay? And the spectrum doesn't change. So again, I will repeat very briefly what are the assumptions on epsilon, mu, and sigma because this will be quite important. So again, you want them to be uh, with values in the space of symmetric matrices. And we have a specific bounds that can be explicitly written in this way, where while epsilon and mu are strictly bounded from below, so these constants here are strictly positive, sigma mean is allowed to be zero. Okay. So um, let me start from, let's say, some basic intuition, okay? So the easiest possible case, if we want to compute the spectrum of this problem, is when you have constant coefficients and you have sigma equal to zero. This is the so-called self adjoint case. And well, I think many of you may have seen this at some point. Well, this is a very easy uh, spectral problem because you can reduce this system to a single equation by taking the curl of the second equation. And then you use the first equation to plug in the value of curl h and you end up with a second order equation in the spectral parameter omega squared. Now, if you take a further divergence of this, you see that this is zero because the divergence of a curl is always zero. And on the other side here, you see omega squared epsilon mu div e. So if omega is not zero, the electric field here will lie in H zero curl intersected H div zero. So we'll have null divergence. So this implies in particular that if you are in a bounded Lipschitz domain because of the result we saw before, the compactness result, the spectrum is just eigenvalues union zero, which in general is 
an eigenvalue of infinite multiplicity. If omega is unbounded, the situation is more complicated because, yeah. Uh, constant coefficients here. We are still, this is just an example. I will, you know, add some complexity going on in, into the talk, but thank you very much for the remark. So, um, if, you are in, if we are instead in unbounded case, then in general you have to keep into account that you have some essential spectrum coming from infinity. So, if you are, let's say, in, in the whole space, then uh, the essential spectrum will be the whole real line, for example. But um, you can have many possible behavior, band gap structure, uh, and, and so on. What is important to note is in both cases, zero is always in the essential spectrum, and this is due to the fact that if you look at this equation, om for omega equal to zero, any gradient fields will satisfy this. So this will be an eigenvalue of infinite multiplicity. So let's add some complexity to, to this problem. Now we look, again, constant coefficients, but now non-self-adjoint. So I can play the same game again, right? So I start from here, and again, I do this reduction by taking the curl of the second equation. Here, I multiply times mu minus one just because I have already mined the case in which this is not constant but invertible, okay? But um, you shouldn't be too much worried about it. And now, again, I can take the divergence. And now you see that instead of having just omega squared, I have omega times omega epsilon plus i sigma. So somehow the idea is that also this point minus i sigma over epsilon, which lies in the negative, on the negative imaginary axis, will be a point of essential spectrum. Now, if you think about the case in which now they are not constant, these coefficients, then as uh, he said before, I cannot invert the divergence with these uh, metrics now, but I can still study what the essential spectrum is by looking at where this matrix is not definite. What I mean with that is that um, both the real part and the imaginary part of that matrix are not definite. In such a case, I'm expecting to have a essential spectrum again. Okay? I will make this a bit more rigorous in a moment. All right, so the, the two main ideas uh, that I've, let's say, that I'm trying to convince you about with these very stupid, if you want, heuristics, is that first, we can analyze the spectrum of V through the second order pencil L. This shouldn't be too surprising because this is basically the first sure complement of uh, the matrix here, V. Um, and the second thing that we have done maybe unconsciously when uh, we apply this divergence is that basically we apply the sort of Helmholtz decomposition to the operator. So what I'm saying is that really formally what you would like to do is to write L of omega with respect to the Helmholtz decomposition. And when you do this, obviously when you take the projection onto the gradients, you don't see this part because the curl of a, uh, of a gradient is zero and the, the projection onto gradient fields of something that is a curl is also zero. So these three parts you see are bounded operators and the only unbounded path now appears here. And again, really formally, you would like the essential spectrum of L to be the union of the essential spectrum coming from these two entries. This is the basic idea. Obviously, this is just formal because you have to be very careful when you apply uh, Helmholtz or any orthogonal decomposition to an unbounded operator because you need to know that the domain decomposes accordingly. And in general, this is not the case, so you, you have to work a bit more, okay? All right, so um, before going to the main results, I need to fix some notation of basic facts about spectral theory. So uh, for non-self-adjoint operators, you have uh, many definitions of what the essential spectrum is. 
and in general they are not equivalent. So in this talk, what, when I, whenever I say essential spectrum, I am thinking about the so-called vial essential spectrum. So are those points in the complex plane for which there exists a vial singular sequence. So this is converging weakly to zero in the Hilbert space, um, such that A minus omega UN converges strongly to zero, okay? Um, an important thing is um, another object that I will use later on is this so-called essential numerical range, which was introduced by Stanfield and Williams in 68 for bounded operators, but then it was really analyzed in, in depth and studied very well by Sabine in her uh, PhD thesis and in several other articles after that. So this is the set of omega and C for which again there exists a vial singular sequence such that A U N against U N minus omega converges strongly to zero. So why would you like to introduce this? Well, because you want something that provides an enclosure for the essential spectrum. And you see immediately that if a point lies in the essential spectrum, just by taking scalar products with U N, then it also lies in W E of A, okay? And you can prove that this is co a convex enclosed set, and so not only contains the essential spectrum, it contains also the convex all of it. Right, so let me now go to the, to the main results. So the, fir the first result I want to present is a decomposition result for the essential spectrum of the Maxwell um, operator. So here the setting is the following. We assume that omega is unbounded. Epsilon, mu, and sigma are again these, uh, these tensors in L infinity of omega in uh, the space of symmetric matrices. And there exists some limit at infinity, epsilon infinity, mu infinity, that are just strictly positive constants, such that at infinity, epsilon mu are just multiples of the identity, while um, sigma vanishes at infinity, okay? So we are assuming that this conductivity is somehow localized on this medium, and at infinity we don't see it anymore, okay? So again, I, I recall that L was this uh, second order pencil, and we can define somehow the limit at infinity of this operator as L infinity of omega, where I've replaced here mu, epsilon, and sigma with uh, is their values at, at infinity. And moreover, I'm assuming these to be restricted to divergence-free vector fields, okay? And on the other hand, we can also compress the pencil L to uh, the space of gradient fields, and then we obtain only this part here, because the remaining part is zero. So the domain of this will be the gradients of H10. And then what you can prove is the following. So I have put all the three references because they all tackle somehow different settings. Okay, so in the first paper by Lassas, he considered only bounded domains. In this paper by Alberti, uh, they had unbounded domains, but they had somehow some topological assumptions that we removed uh, in, in our uh, paper. So what you can prove is that the essential spectrum of the original Maxwell operator is equal to the essential spectrum of L, which is equal to the union of the essential spectrum of L infinity and the essential spectrum of W nabla. So um, le let me try to explain what this means. So this part here, contains the contribution to the essential spectrum that comes from local dissipative effects. So meaning you have uh, some gradient field that is localized in a precise point around in the domain, and this gives you some essential spectrum. On the other hand, L infinity gives you the contribution from infinity, okay? So you can really split the two parts, which is somehow not trivial at all that you can do this um, for many reasons. One of the many is that um, such a decomposition as 
I was saying before, you cannot directly apply this Helmholtz decomposition directly to L. All right, so, okay. I might actually skip this idea of the proof. I briefly talked to uh, you about this, and because I want to go to uh, the second um, part regarding approximation of this operator. But before I do that, um, are there any questions about this part? Okay, I'm not a physicist, <laughs> so <laughs> first of all, but um, yeah, so I think, exactly. So there is a very nice idea, well, okay, it's more a mathematical intuition if you want, but um, about this essential spectrum. So this essential spectrum appears when you lose the ellipticity of this operator. So you can write these in a, in a suitable space. You can look at that as minus the divergence of omega epsilon plus i sigma nabla. Okay, so this is the operator you're looking at. And when this somehow is not um, defined in a sense, so this is complex, okay? But let's say that for a moment this is just, um, okay. The thing is you have to look at both the real and the imaginary part of this matrix. If one of the two is definite, then you don't have a problem because you can apply Lux Milgram and therefore, uh, you know, you don't have problems that the operator is invertible and you are in the resolvent set. But if this, for some reason, uh, you know, has, is indefinite, both in the real and the imaginary part, this gives you a essential spectrum and there is a precise construction to prove that. You can construct a vial sequence which focuses on those points where this ellipticity phase. Okay, this is somehow standard construction, if you want. Uh, I don't know. I I don't have a more probably intuition about the physical meaning. I guess I could say that you have some you know wave packets here. So instead of having eigenvalues, you will have to look at wave packets. And the fact that you have a singular sequence me is means that somehow along one of these wave packets you are going to infinity, so you can translate this bump at infinity, that will give you a singular sequence, and in that way you can construct the essential spectrum. But maybe we can um, discuss a bit more about this. I, I don't think I've answered very well your question, but uh, um, let, me, let me go to the, to the other results. So, Okay, so this second set of results is about domain truncation. So you have again this unbounded Lipschitz domain, and you have a monotonical increasing sequence of Lipschitz bounded domains which are exhausting omega. Okay, so you can imagine you're taking the intersection of omega with, with some balls of increasing radius in, in the easy case at least, if omega is well behaved, and you're uh, enlarging, okay, these, these domains. We do, we do not have any assumption on the topology of omega. So, for example, the, the complement of omega might have uh, infinitely many connected components. And we restrict the Maxwell pencil uh, to every domain by putting electric boundary conditions on the boundary of omega n. And the question is, is it true or not that the spectrum of V of n is a good approximation of the spectrum of V for large n? So, um, in general, this is a very difficult question because you might have what you have, what you, what is called spectral pollution. So, um, you might have a sequence of spectral points that converge to some point which is in the resolvent set of the limiting operator. So uh, here I've been deliberately vague on the convergence that you want on the operators because obviously depending on what you're, what you're assuming on this convergence, spectral pollution may or may not appear. But let's say if just the resolvents of these operators are converging in strong sense, then spectral pollution can appear, okay? 
And um, just a quick example of what can go wrong and go very fast. There is this classical example by Davis. So in this picture, the red parabola is the uh, essential spectrum of A, and these blue dots are the eigenvalues of the truncated operator, say n. So these are all real, and they never ever uh, approximate those points on the parabola. So here you can see clearly that the limit points of these truncated operators will never be close to the real spectrum. So I mean, real, not real, <laughs> in the sense of uh, uh, mathematics, in the sense of the truthful uh, spectrum. Okay. So okay. So finally, I'm ready to present the main results about domain truncation. So again, I've recalled here the assumptions. So asymptotic. Um, so th the, coefficient, the coefficients are asymptotically constant, and you have these two nice limiting operators, L infinity and W nabla, that will play a role. And then what you can prove is, if you define lambda E omega mean as the minimum of the essential spectrum of this operator, curve curve zero, restricted to divergence-free vector fields, this, in, this is general a non-negative quantity because this operator is a positive definite, it's also joint positive definite, then what, what you can see is that the spectral pollution due to the Maxwell, to the main truncation um, for, for your Maxwell operator is contained in the WE, so in the essential numerical range of L infinity, which can be explicitly computed, and it, it's the union of two half lines in, in R. And therefore, or better, moreover, every isolated points, which is uh, in the point spectrum outside this union of these two sets, can be approximated exactly, so without spectral pollution. And this is interesting because this can happen even inside the numerical range of the operator, where for, you know, for non-self-adjoint operators, usually when you are inside the numerical range, it's very hard to uh, find any sort of estimate, resolvent estimate or whatever, because you might have pseudo-spectral effects. And so let me conclude with a picture. So um, this is from our paper. So here you see uh, the spectrum of the full Maxwell in uh, a full waveguide. So we have something of this form, straight waveguide. Epsilon mu are just identity, and the sigma is a um, characteristic function of zero one. So the essential spectrum is the part in red and the eigenvalues are in blue. And now you see the eigenvalues of the truncated operators here. So you have many eigenvalues that are accumulating to the essential spectrum. But apart from those, all the others, uh, well, they look similar, but from our theorem actually, you can prove that these are good approximation of the eigenvalues that you see here. So these three points here are indeed uh, points in the essential spectrum, and these three points are those due to this um, uh, W nabla pencil that we, we saw in the theorem. And uh, I could talk probably other 10 minutes about how, how to find these points, and this would be interesting, but my time is over, so I will stop here. Thank you.